techniques uh, to uh, neophyte as well as to seasoned uh, musicians who wanted to inject some sort of new percussion modes and ideas into uh, their own uh, kind of uh, uh, drumming. And uh, later, I noticed that uh, uh, Olatunji actually uh, began uh, to be even more sophisticated and deep in his drumming. And this, I think, took place after his first visit back home uh, following so many years in uh, cultural exile. He began to diversify. And very soon, even his students, uh, the seasoned musicians, some of whom he had partially taught, uh, had to run to catch up with the speed with which he was uh, developing his style of drumming. Now, fast forward. Fast forward to a number of years. And let me take you to an apartment in Manhattan. And a meeting with Quincy Jones, the musician who became later the producer of um, um, the uh, video, uh, the music videos of Michael Jackson. He invited me to come and listen to um, the, the, and discuss the uh, turning one of my plays, The Lion and the Jewel, into a musical. He played through his composition. When I got there, I found he had already done the composition. He played through and uh, on the piano. At the end of it, he turned to me expectantly. Well, I was not enthralled. And I think it showed on my face. So worried, he asked me hesitatingly what I thought of it. And I had to tell him, quite frankly, that uh, I could not grasp, I could not discern the kind of uh, rhythms which I had in mind when I wrote the play. And as I had envisioned it, whenever it would appear on stage, I felt something was missing. Of course, I realized that he was going to say immediately, well, you know, I only played it out on the piano. So I quickly assured him that, yes, I had listened also to the underlying rhythm of his composition. Uh, and that I felt that there was a missing tonality as well as a rhythm to it. Very different. Naturally, he was not amused. I would spend some time arguing. It reminded me that he was a, uh, of Afri African American, of African descent, and that Africans were, in fact, the pioneers of uh, the musical in uh, the United States. Uh, we went on for uh, quite a while, and I said, Yes, I, I knew that, and I told him that I admired enormously American musicals, but I said, There just is something missing. So eventually, I said, Look, why don't you? when you have a time. Take a trip to the African continent. Uh, go around the nightclubs. Go to the villages and just listen and feel the pulsation of that society, of, of those people. So we parted um, rather uh, amicable terms, but rather grudgingly. Um, a few years later, I got a message from him. Uh, he'd spoken to somebody after our meeting and uh, eventually, apparently, he'd come to West Africa. As a matter of fact, he went to Ghana. He didn't come to Nigeria. And he said, um, are you going to see Brother Soyinka? And I said, yes. He said, he knew me so well. Tell him he was damn right. I've been to Ghana, and I just had some new sound, just blew my mind. And got back to my music, started working things over again. And he visited Ghana a number of times. As I said, I don't think he came to Nigeria, but he heard enough in Ghana to not throw away the music he had composed. He, of course, musicians don't throw anything away. And he used it for another play, and uh, he abandoned the idea of uh, uh, creating music for that. Now, a third experience, this time in Chicago, uh, where I went to direct the uh, Death and the King's Horseman. I took, I was, I was lucky, I was able to take about four people from Nigeria uh, headed by Tunji Oyelana. 
and the cast was largely African-American. Now, you know very well that African-Americans, they make fun of their white counterparts like mad. Can dance, tone deaf, can't hear any rhythm, etc., etc. So they were shocked. In fact, I think I just escaped lynching when one day I told them, I said, you know, the problem with you people is that you can't dance. Yeah. That was a declaration of war. You're telling an African American, you can't dance. I said, yeah, that's your problem. You cannot dance. Before that, I told them they were tone deaf. That they didn't mind so much because even they knew that they couldn't pronounce the Yoruba names properly. They knew there was something wrong, but uh, they couldn't quite follow it. But now to come and tell them that they couldn't dance. Ah, they say, this brother is an enemy. So finally I said, all right, well, with the help of uh, Tunji and my choreographer, the American choreographer, who was West Indian, by the way, I said, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to break you into little pieces. I'll break your bones, your joints, into little pieces. And then we'll put those pieces together. I said, it'll be a painful process, but we'll put you through certain body motions, and you'll never be the same again. So the exercises began. Tunji and his uh, colleagues began beating rhythms they'd never heard before. So we broke down the rhythms, we broke down their bodies, we put their bodies back together. In the end, uh, sometimes they'd be walking the streets and break into dances, and people didn't understand what had happened to them. Incidentally, and I'm going to talk to, I'm going to, talk to some of um, the demonstrators here to see if they can do some illustrations about, the, about polyrhythm, the, which, for which Africa, of course, is very famous. Uh, people who are not really Africans cannot discern uh, the, 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 the working together of different beats, which then come together in what we call polyrhythm. It's like you listen to sounds of different instruments that seem to be wandering all over the landscape, and then you continue to listen and you discern this interfoliation of various beats and timbres. You hear that kind of polyrhythm, usually in uh, traditional, on traditional occasions, like royal processions, when the shekere is doing one thing, the bembe, another, the bata, another, gong, gong, etc., etc., and of course the flutes, the royal flutes, and yet each one going all their different ways, and suddenly there is a coming together, and they all come home and rest with a great emotional impact in unison. And so the team played all that for them, and they were listening to something, a new weave that they didn't even know existed. I said, Boogaloo is all very well, and Bum is all very well, and Rock and Roll all very well, yes. But you listen to what these people from Nigeria have to offer you. And it's amazing the transformation which took place over there. Those of you who might have had the luck, as I did, of listening to Winton Marsalis, not playing his solo instruments or the regular jazz uh, 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 items, but on his big band, will understand that this is one American musician who has come to terms with polyrhythm. His Congo Square, I don't know any of you who, uh, you know, have that. His, his big band is made up of both African and uh, African American musicians. He, has instrumentation from all over the continent, including the from Tom Tom and uh, uh, Kroboto drums. I love those names from the Ghanaian drums. And he had the Ghanaian musicians. He had one or two uh, Senegalese musicians. I can't remember if he had any uh, Nigerian. Yeah? Palongo as well. He had the Palongo drums as well. And uh, he had a huge band of. Uh, Close to, I think, 50 or so. Yeah, from Tom Tom, yeah, I've mentioned that. I'm talking about the, um, the makeup of the personnel. In, uh, 
it's adding